This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. talk about xenoestrogens and mammographic breast density. So I'll just begin by acknowledging um, many collaborators. So Brian Sprague is at the University of Vermont, and I also have, um, he, so he did um, a, the lion's share of the work here. Um, the, my collaborators at Group Health Research Institute in Seattle, and also the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene in Madison um, were instrumental in the work we did that I'll present here. So uh, we've heard a lot about BPA over the past couple days, so I don't think I need to belabor this point um, that BPA, uh, how we're exposed to it. Um, so uh, it's uh, in the liner of many cans, and uh, also what um, it's rapidly um, eliminated through the urine in our bodies, but um, and most of us are exposed. And um, even though it's believed that the amount of expo the exposure levels are low, um, the point is, is that we're continuously exposed to these things. And so that's um, really the source of our concern. And why is this relevant to breast cancer? Um, because of um, quite substantial um, research done in the laboratory suggesting that it does act like an environmental estrogen. Um, but different groups have reviewed the evidence, and essentially, I'm unable to find uh, studies that have looked at health effects, at, well, breast cancer outcomes in women. So we know that in laboratory studies, um, it's suggested that it's related to breast cancer. We know that we're exposed, but we don't have that last step of saying, we've done a study and shown that exposure to BPA causes breast cancer. So what we did is, we, the, the ultimate goal here would be to do exactly that, to be able to observe that if a woman's <laughs> exposed to BPA, then that follows causally to breast cancer. But that would take um, a long time and more resources and a perhaps more intermediate feasible goal to do in the short term is to use a marker, um, breast, mammographic breast density, and just measure BPA and density at one point in time. So this is our first um, step towards looking at the health effects of BPA in humans. So as Mary Beth introduced, mammographic breast density is um, measured using software called Cumulus, uh, where it's operator assisted. So a human does need to go in, outline the breast, but, and help the computer to calculate uh, the dense tissue from the fatty tissue. And uh, this may seem fairly straightforward, um, but it's actually, as Mary Beth showed, it's one of the strongest risk factors for breast cancer. Only female sex and age and BRCA1 mutation status are stronger risk factors. So um, breast density is very strongly associated with breast cancer, and it's assumed to be um, to reflect long-term exposure to hormones, but it also is something that is modifiable. So if a woman takes tamoxifen or postmenopausal hormone use, um, exposure to that can change mammographic density. So it's something that um, is modifiable. So uh, to do this study, we recruited women who were going to two different mammography clinics for routine screening mammograms in 2008 and 2009. These were all postmenopausal women. And uh, it took 13 months to recruit about 260 odd women. And we could have done this a lot faster but what we decided is, is we wanted to only recruit women who had never taken postmenopausal hormones. And so even though in response to the Women's Health Initiative and other studies, fewer women were starting hormones, many, many women had taken it earlier on. And um, if we had enrolled women who had taken hormones because hormones do influence breast density, we would have had to somehow 
you know, incorporate that into our analytic approach. And just to make it cleaner, we really wanted a population of women who had never been exposed to hormones. We measured mammographic density using this cumulative, uh, cumulus software. And we also, um, each woman completed a questionnaire so we could ask about body weight and other factors that are important, perhaps um, not only in affecting breast density, but also potential sources for BPA and other um, environmental exposures that we are interested in. So women donated blood so that we were able to evaluate not only BPA, but two other phenols uh, using um, laboratory methods that I have a hard time <laughs> pronouncing. And um, with the analysis, we took into consideration age and body mass index because those are also important in terms of um, breast density levels. And so what we did is we calculated the average breast density for three groups of women. So if um, the serum levels of the phenol was too, well, it was so low that um, our analytic approach in the lab was unable to detect it, so it was below the limit of detection. And then among the women with detectable levels of the phenols, we split them in half, essentially. So we calculated the breast density in these three groups. This plot shows how breast density was distributed in our study sample, and this is what we would expect. So as women age, their breasts become less dense. And so you can see this curve is all skewed toward the left because um, they were uh, postmenopausal women. Density um, was on the lower end, so on average about 15%. So this is our main data slide where if we start with nonophenol here, you can see that if we look at the average breast density value among women with not without detectable levels of nonophenol, breast density was on average about the same as it was among women with detectable levels of this phenol. But if we do look at BPA, women with the highest levels of BPA also had the highest levels of breast density. And the important thing I want to emphasize here is there's about a 5% on average difference in breast density among women without detectable levels and women with the highest detectable levels of BPA. Um, and so this is where, you know, epidemiologists, we like to look at subgroups and slice and dice our data. Um, it's such a rich data source, you want to look at it all. And so in, for this session, because of the emphasis on windows of susceptibility and how, um, just like with exogenous medication hormones, perhaps exposure to BPA closer to menopause <coughs> could be um, more important than farther out. And so this is uh, weak. I don't want to be making any strong statements here, but there's a suggestion that perhaps among women, if we cut the data in half in terms of women who were closer to when they went through menopause, breast density does seem to increase with greater exposure to BPA, and um, it's not as clear of a trend among women who went through menopause a, um, a longer time ago. So I certainly don't want to overinterpret the data, but this was the first um, attempt to look at this Windows idea and um, the timing of when BPA occurs. Um, the other way that we uh, looked at the data in different subgroups is to look at the BPA density association depending on whether the women were obese or not. And so among the women who were obese, breast density was about the same regardless of the level of exposure to BPA. But among women who were not obese, the leaner women, density appeared elevated among women with the highest levels of exposure to BPA. And so if we were to try to interpret this biologically, the reason body fat is important is because after the ovaries aren't producing estrogen and progesterone anymore, it, that production is happening in the fat tissue, okay? So potentially you could say here, among um, the heavier women, the body fat is producing estrogen that is perhaps overwhelming any effect that BPA would have. But among the leader women, um, BPA may be the primary source of um, estrogen. Again, I don't want to overinterpret this. This is a, just the first study, given the study limitations, but this goes along to, um, with other theories. Um, we, in terms of BPA exposure, we didn't ask the women the right questions, I don't think. So we looked at whether BPA exposure was related to questions we um, asked in our survey, 
and BPA wasn't related to whether their level of drinking alcohol or smoking or several things in the diet, whether they drank bottled water. Um, other studies have shown that uh, BPA could be exposed to um, how often people eat outside the home and issues like that. So it's not to say that um, you can't ask women about their BPA exposure and get a good measurement. For us, having the blood measurement was essential because our questionnaire data couldn't have represented that well. Also just wanted to know um, for any density experts in the room that we repeated the analysis for percent density as well as dense area and the results were consistent. So to summarize the strengths and limitations of the study, these were all women living in one county in Wisconsin. Um, and so future studies, um, it, it would be a good idea to have a much more diverse sample. Also, we measured density and BPA at one point in time. And so what we would really want to do in the future is to know that we are measuring <laughs> BPA um, over a longer period of time prior to the density assessment so that you can get in, you can um, make more inferences in terms of cause and effect. And also, many samples <coughs> were below the limit of detection using this serum measure. And that doesn't mean women weren't exposed to BPA. It just means that in serum, the levels are so very, very low that you can't detect them. On the other hand, um, the, using urine, you'd be able to measure BPA in many more women. But um, any BPA exposure you have uh, is often just eliminated uh, essentially within five to seven hours. Okay, most of it um, leaves your body through urine, but one to two percent of it um, is detected in the blood. So you can see how the serum levels are much, much lower. But you could also think that what we measure in blood is actually more biologically relevant because that's what's circulating in your body and that's perhaps what the breast is exposed to. So there are pros and cons in terms of whether you're using urine or serum to measure BPA. Um, so I feel like using breast density is a real strength. Many other environmental studies of breast cancer have used these case control designs where blood is drawn and you're measuring BPA or PCBs or other environmental things after women have been diagnosed. And so you're not really sure the extent to which cancer or cancer treatments like chemotherapy are influencing your measurements. And so by doing a study in a sample of women, none of whom have been diagnosed with breast cancer, you're really looking at, um, you know, that the cancer process isn't influencing your exposure assessment values. And also we're, um, the other critical drawback perhaps of prior environmental studies is that um, we're, we are able to really zero in on these windows. If we're concerned about the timing of pregnancy, you can evaluate, um, you know, mammographic density, not while a woman's pregnant, but uh, closer to the time that you're concerned about. And in this case, it's um, closer to the time of menopause. So if we want to think about what to do next, um, so this is suggestive that um, BPA may be related to density. Certainly we'd want to do other studies that um, address limitations, larger studies and more diverse samples. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I, my intention here is not to scare you any more than you're already worried about BPA, that just the practical realities of life, um, you know, you may not be able to avoid all canned fruits and vegetables and meat. And um, so, at least from my perspective, we don't have the data to absolutely say that BPA causes breast cancer, and so I think it's a reasonable choice to eat canned tuna once in a while, but um, certainly we want to continue evaluating this. Also, to repeat my um, point about this 5% increase in density with the women with the higher BPA levels, this is clinically relevant because this 5% difference in breast density is what is observed if a woman does take postmenopausal hormones for a year. So this 5% change in density also has been seen in other studies to map to about a 5 to 10% increase in risk of breast cancer. So um, many times with breast cancer studies, we're talking about modest effects, and it may not be big, but at least it um, can definitely be relevant. Um, in terms of moving forward, and we certainly, you know, what's the next study we want to do? We certainly don't want to do an intervention to see if, if a woman takes BPA, if that increases her risk, her density, but rather, I think the time is now for when we can do an intervention 
Studies have shown that if you um, modify your lifestyle, that you are able to reduce your exposure to BPA. So I think it would be interesting to randomize women to a lifestyle behavioral intervention and see if their breast density does go down. Um, our study did not suggest that these two other phenols were related to density, and if you're trying to save your nickels and dimes, um, may be warranted to focus on BPA. Um, like I said, we need prospective designs to um, be able to tell, uh, you know, I certainly don't think density changes your BPA levels, um, so I think we can be fairly certain that uh, BPA precedes density changes, but we certainly would want prospective study designs. Um, the study does suggest that we would want to consider whether women, uh, their body weight in terms of evaluating these. And also my last comment is to not forget the lessons of the Women's Health Initiative and other studies where in this PIKE model that was proposed nearly 30 years ago, that um, it appears that estrogen and progesterone together is what may be most relevant to risk. And I haven't heard people talk about xenoprogesterones before, but I think it's time to um, think about, again, these mixtures, um, these multiple different chemicals and in, um, hormones that we're exposed to. Um, so again, these are my collaborators, and I should acknowledge that um, we were very lucky to have um, funding from several different sources, NIH, um, the Komen Foundation, and the Department of Defense Breast Cancer Research Program. So thank you very much.